Um, so and here we. So and, and then so here's here's the. Uh, you might want to just find out where. Oh, this these are single pages, aren't they? So, yes. Good lord. <laughs> See, I'm doing David Mislanka um, for this forum. Uh, the article I'm writing is covering his mid to weight work that he composed. However, I think in order to have any sort of understanding of that, you need to have an understanding, obviously, of his early career. Um, so I'll start with a question because I'm genuinely curious. How many people in this room are familiar with the music of David Mislanka? Kind of. I played a piece of his once. Piece of his once, okay. Um, so not many people are familiar. So the reason I chose to isolate the middle to late period is because that's where his style really locked in and you could hear a piece and in the first 10 seconds, no, oh, that's David Maslanka. Early work, not so much. It's very choppy and jarring. He's still trying to find himself. And that has in part to do with his own life. Up there in the right hand corner, that is him and his wife um, towards the end of their life. His wife passed away in June of 2016 and then David followed um, shortly thereafter in August of the same year. Um, and those of us that knew him personally were pretty sure he had cancer, but it was pretty likely a broken heart was what took him because Allison Matthews had been with him his entire career. And especially in his early career, she was kind of the rock that kept him going. He was a notorious alcoholic, very violent, living in New York City, just finishing work on his doctorate degree at New York University while teaching there at the time. And pieces he was pumping out at this time were nothing major, no symphonies really no big chamber music, that's all later. This work was small chamber music, like the Quintet for Winds, one, two, and three, which if you're familiar with that piece, it's very evident that that's early music because it just doesn't sound cohesive at all. Um, and what sparked that change is partially true and partially legend. So. What we knew about Maslanka and what I knew from personal experience working with him is he made the choice to move to Missoula, Montana, just kind of at a moment's notice. The way he told the story is that him and his wife grab a bunch of thumbtacks, close their eyes, throw it at a map, it lands on Missoula and that's where he spent the rest of his life. So he moved to Missoula around late to mid thirties and then obviously stayed there about another 40 years. And when he was in Missoula, this is where the big bulk of the work came out. And why that work came out is very, very interesting. So why that is, is because of J.S. Bach, the guy there on the top left, and C.G. Jung on the bottom left. We all know Bach, obviously. Not as much of us are familiar with C.G. Jung. So I'll start there. C.G. Jung was a French uh, psychologist uh, in the early 1800s that wrote a series of treatises on meditation. His works at the time were viewed as kind of crazy, a little paranoid, because they didn't follow the general teachings of psychology. So what the teachings he lined out were, that David picked up on, were primarily in the Red Book. The Red Book is a very short book, no more than 250 pages. The C.G. Jung describes his self-meditation process to where he got in to what he considered uh, the psyche or the subconscious. 
and transported himself to hell and did a whole writing on this. David became very interested in this technique and started to implement it for himself and would tell several people in rehearsals uh, along with in his program notes about how this meditation technique influenced his writing. Like in Give Us This Day, that piece was written um, to more or less bring some sort of peace back to humanity. And he meditated and saw visions of war and destruction and thought that was the music that needed to be produced. Uh, what's also really interesting to note here from my own personal experience is in rehearsals, he would always demand, I don't care how hard the music is, you play what I've written, the music sounds the way the universe wants it to sound. And that has always, that stuck with me. And that's where I get my drive to do what I'm doing up here. Uh, a couple of questions what caused that dramatic shift in his music? Obviously, uh, the readings of C.G. Jung had a huge impact of it on it, but the biggest impact other than that was Bach. And obviously, like I said, we all know Bach very well. Um, but I would argue that Maslanka had an understanding of Bach that I have yet to see rivaled. So every morning after moving to Missoula, he lived on a little farmhouse about 20 miles outside of the town and there was a little barn in the back every morning he would go from 9 a.m. to noon four straight hours and play two or three of the 371 Bach chorales play three voices sing a voice until he got through soprano alto tenor and bass and this eventually started to really inspire him to get out of whatever rut he was in. And you can really start see, seeing his understanding of Bach coming through around 1995, 1996, about the halfway point of just moving to Missoula. The works this influence is first noticeable in is first piece is Child's Garden of Dreams. Anybody familiar with that piece? Yep. So Child's Garden of Dreams is, I believe, a six movement piece, each one with its own unique title, like Girl on the Moon is Transported to Hell. And these are all very descriptive titles that come from his own meditations and what he would see. That piece mends the gap between early and middle. It has the jarriness of his early work but you can also tell he's trying to go somewhere else but he's not quite sure where that is yet so fast forward about another two years 1997 the university of texas at austin with jerry junkin commissioned symphony number no. four by david maslanka and that piece really solidified middle to late career for david um, if anybody's familiar with that piece, chord, if you're familiar with that, it starts with a horn solo. Ba -da -da and the horn solo, along with the doxology and the final chorales are all Bach statements. The final statement of the theme actually is in low brass and it's the old tune, Old Hundredth, that we all know and love, that translates to be BW 173 out of one, 168, I'd have to check the exact corral that it is of the 371 corrals. But that is exactly where you can tell, okay, there's a shift going on. And then four, five, and six can all lump in as symphonies for, I'd say, middle. Then you can have seven and eight just kind of on their own. And then nine and 10 are completely different entities for him. So the, these two questions, two and three, I believe go together. So why is the music so important to all ensembles and is the 10th symphony the way that David would have finished it? So I'll start with the third question. The reason I asked that question is David didn't actually finish his 10th symphony. So he was commissioned <laughs> on a consortium 
again with the University of Texas, this time the University of Ohio, University of uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, to write a 10th symphony, and then immediately following that, an 11th symphony. So he immediately began work on a 10th, which usually he could have his pieces out four to five months after commission. However, at the very beginning process, he was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. So he tried to expedite as much as he could. And I think that goes without saying for a lot of us, that takes a lot of willpower because I couldn't keep going five hours a day if that was a diagnosis I got. So that's a huge admiration. Um, but with that being said, what he did finish with the 10th Symphony was the entire first movement, sketches of the second, and a complete sketch of the fourth. And the first movement was actually completed twice, which I think is interesting to note, especially for listening purposes. It was written in a red-hot fury in about a week, and it's about 11 minutes of music, and completely powerhouse of sound, overwhelming, and then week prior to that, his wife dies and completely scraps the first movement, rewrites it, and retitles it Allison. The second movement was very lightly based on a meditation and a sketch he had done entitled the, A Mother and Boy Watching the River of Time, which, as I'm aware from my connection to his family, had to do with him, his wife, and his son, Matthew Mislanka, sitting near the Bitterroot of the Clark Fork River in Montana, watching, discussing, enjoying each other's company. And he got about halfway through that movement, and if you listen to it, you'll hear statements that are just undeniably David Mislanka, and it's powerful. However, the reason that question is there is because of the third and fourth movements. So the third movement was in its essence about four bars of music when he passed away. The fourth movement was more, more completed. However, what happened was his son, Matthew, was charged with finishing this work. Matthew was on a flight to Missoula after a phone call from David, and by the time he got there the next morning, David had passed away, and they had to work with whatever scraps they had. And the third movement is very much semblant of David and his music, and it has characteristics of it that are definitely emotionally driving and give you a new experience each time you listen to it. However, the question that's always asked, is that what he would have written? And of course, none of us know, and that's one of the great questions. Up here on my sources, you see Onsby Rose. Onsby C. Rose, who is fortunately enough, a friend of mine is the director of bands at uh, Dort University in Iowa, and he did his doctoral dissertation on this question. and. The general consensus is, no, that's not the way it would have been finished if he still lived. However, I think we have a better symphony because it was finished that way, because of the raw intensity of emotion in it, but the completely unforgiving parts. Um, with that all being said, also on my sources is davidmislanka.com, which is run by Matthew Mislanka, his son, and Catherine Mislanka, who both still live in his house in Missoula. Um, wonderful resource. They publish all of David's journals, his doodlings, his sketches, um, new recordings by new wind ensembles, chamber groups, etc. cetera. Um, and also they are in the process through community funding across the country as well as in Missoula of opening his house up. Um, to the general public is a museum to allow people to see original drafts of symphonies and chamber music that haven't been released. Uh, also on my sources is Stephen P. Bolstad, 
uh, former director of bands at University of Montana. So he obviously had a close relationship with David. And now director of bands at uh, some college up east. I'm not 100% sure on that. James Madison University, James Madison University. Um, that is a dissertation on the Fourth Symphony, which does more detail than I'm doing here, but highlights every single statement of a Bach theme. Nice, wonderful. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna keep going. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, so we don't have that to go off of anymore. Um, you have three. You have three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Yeah, everyone wins. Yeah, I'll go like this. With that being said, then I've been talking for about twenty. Well, any questions? Okay. All right. Well, Never mind. So is that your conclusion? Um, yeah, I've okay. talked about everything I have to. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of, since we have, do have a little bit of time, I would say, and there'd be no questions, but we do have a little bit of wiggle room here. Um, in, in looking, looking at, at the pieces, and you were mentioning the idea of um, excerpts or moments that are, are definitive in Tonka. Right. Okay, uh, what do you determine, because this is going to be like, I guess, it, all of us have our, have our challenge in our work. Um, if you're conveying an idea like that, what are you going to rely on in reference to what is definitive Matranka in the work? Like, uh, for that? Yeah, uh, or just one example, because I'm sure you have many. Right. So for that in my paper, I'm actually, um, not to not answer the question for you guys, but in my paper I have snippets of parts of scores all combining and contrasting to show how they connect through the music. And to answer that question, for you guys, one of the staples of his music is instead of scoring for a big, thick wind ensemble sound all of the time, which he does a good majority, it's more broken up into sections of the band. So you'll have the woodwinds playing completely on their own for 20 minutes. And in 10 minutes later, you'll have the brass coming in and you were forgetting they're sitting on stage. But another thing that can define his music is what I was talking about is the influence of Bach, right? It's been a challenge for me to research his music to find that connection and I wish it was easy, I could just give you an answer like that, there's the connection, but it's not because he will start a movement, like let's say the second movement of the 10th symphony, it starts with about 40 bars of a reharmonized Bach chorale, and then it continues through the whole movement, but there's new melodic material introduced and harmonic material and all sorts of stuff that hide it so well in there that Basically, you need to be like an archeologist and get in there with a pickaxe and brush to really find these understandings. All right. All right. Thanks, Terry. Thank you.